back at it again. Top shelf-ish only. Let's go. Let me begin by saying that the two Python project setups that I will walk through in this video are linked below in a Git repo in case you don't want to watch the whole video. In the Git repo, you should see two branches. The first branch is called Project Setup for Python 2 and 3. This project shows how to organize files and folders on your computer when you are building apps that require earlier versions of Python. It is recommended that when you start new projects, you should use the latest versions of Python, but depending on the requirements of your app, you may need to use older or earlier versions of Python. The second branch in the repo is called Project Setup for Python 3.7 Plus. This project shows a more modern way to set up your files and folders, but it requires Python 3.7 Plus. Python was created in the early 1990s by a Dutch programmer named Guido Van Rossum. I apologize if I'm pronouncing his name incorrectly. What is now one of the most popular programming languages in the world started off as a hobby project of Rossum's. Python 1.0 was released on January 1994 and is now considered to be obsolete. Python 2.0 was released October 2000 and is no longer in active development but is still quite prevalent, the last official version of Python 2 being 2.7.18. Python 3.0 was released December 2008 and is the last major version of Python that has been released. Around the time of recording, the Core Python team has announced on several occasions that they have no plans of releasing a Python 4.0 for the foreseeable future and that if they ever were to release a Python 4.0, that Python 3.0 would still be under active development for a period of between 5 and 15 years after the release of Python 4.0. So long story short, the information I am sharing with you in this video is likely to have a very long shelf life. This is what's going to happen for the rest of this video. I'll start by giving an overview of the prerequisites you will need and give you some tips on how to install Python. And then we will build the first project setup from scratch. And then we will build the second project setup. Some of the things I'm showing you will be very specific to the components I'm using, but you can still follow along to get an understanding of how everything comes together. On my OS, I can run this command to install Python to install Python in one step. But if it doesn't work for you and you are not using a Mac OS similar to mine, just Google how to install Python on my computer. After installing Python, you can type either Python capital V if you install the version of Python 2 or Python 3 capital V if you install the version of Python 3. If you see a version number returned, then you likely installed Python correctly. Many versions of Python come by default with a tool called pip. Pip is a tool that allows you to install third-party libraries and packages from the Python community and use them in your project. I ran this command in my terminal to check that pip is installed. If this command doesn't work for you, then Google how to install pip on my computer. For those of you who are familiar with Node.js or Ruby on Rails, pip is to Python what npm is to Node.js or bundler is to Ruby. Now that we have Python and pip installed, let's take a close look at the first project setup. Here I have opened up a folder on my computer with VS Code. And we can see that inside of this folder, there exists one file called readme.md. When we're done with this walkthrough, you can take the final boilerplate project and choose to use it to build your own Python applications. You will tweak this readme file to contain information and documentation that is relevant to the application that you create. I prefer not to have one huge readme file at the root of my project, but instead have smaller readme files for organizational purposes. I put each readme file inside of the readme's folder. Right now, the readme's folder has one readme with information that I will use to guide me as I set up this first Python project. We already have Python installed. We already have pip installed. So let's install our first third-party package, virtual env. I already have it installed. Let's verify the version. The reason that we need virtual env is that Python by default installs packages globally on our system. This means that if we have two products on our computer that use the same third-party package but require different versions of the third-party package, we won't be able to run both apps at the same time. For example, let's say that we have project A on our computer that uses a third-party package called awesome package but uses version six. Let's say that we also have project B on our computer, but project B uses awesome package version seven. When referencing packages from our Python code, 
we can only specify the name of the package, not the version. So an issue will arise when running either project A or B because one of them will not be referencing the version of the package it needs. So what virtual env does is set up our project to not install and use packages globally, but instead set us up to install and use packages within our project folder. This then allows each project on our computer to use its preferred versions of packages without affecting other projects. Here is how we can use vmv. This command is how we can create a folder in our project that will house all of the Python packages we install. The final argument of this command is the name of the folder that we want to use. You can call it whatever you want, but by convention, it is called the VM folder. The next thing to do is configure our terminal or our shell to configure pip to install whatever packages we choose to install in our project into this VM folder. And we do that with this command. If this command was successful, you should see that your terminal prompt has changed to this. Before it was this, now it is this. Let's smoke test everything to make sure that we're on the right track. We're creating a file called main.py. Let's throw some code into that file and let's execute the main.py file. And we can see that hello world has been printed. Now let's run this command, Python main.py without the three. And we can see it works. Another thing that VM does is alias the Python command to whatever version of Python you have installed in your project. Let's develop this main.py file to be a little bit more intricate now. Let's use these packages in the app we are about to develop pandas and matplotlib and we are going to graph some temperature data let's throw some temperature data into this file come back to our readme and let's copy our new program into main.py Save that. Let's run main.py. Voila. Let's close that. Let me just show you two more things. The first of the last two things being bookkeeping of the third-party packages we have installed into our application. If you are familiar with Node.js or Ruby on Rails, then you know about the package.json or gem files. These are files that record all of the third-party packages we have installed into our application. PIP or Python does not do this by default. We have to manually execute this as another step. PIP freeze will spit out all of the third-party packages as well as their versions. And the second half of this command will pipe this into a file that is conventionally named requirements.txt. The second of the last two things is regarding the .git ignore. In Node.js development, you do not store the node modules folder into revision control. And in Python development, you do not store the VM folder into revision control. So let's add a .git ignore and I will copy this suggested .gitignore file from GitHub and paste it into our project. Actually, let me show you one last thing, and that is what the reactivation process would look like. So if we type deactivate, we see that we are now outside or have exited our virtual environment, right? So if you wanted to collaborate on this project with a friend, for example, they would not get the VM folder. They would get something like this, right? This is what they would clone. And they would run the project like so. They would 
hopefully already have Python, pip, and virtual env installed. They would generate the VM folder. They would activate their shell. You can see that the terminal prompt has changed. And then they would reinstall all of the packages listed in the requirements.txt file. That wraps up project setup number one. Great for using with Python 2 or early versions of Python 3. Now let's take a look at project setup number two. It's a more modern setup that you can use with versions of Python 3.7 or later. We will use project setup number one as the starting point for building up project setup number two. I have added a readme to the readme's folder that we will use to guide us through this process. And we will begin by installing a Python package onto our system by the name of poetry. Here's the command you can use to download poetry. I have already installed it, but I will run through these steps nonetheless. After you download poetry, you should add this command to your shell initialization script. For example, if you're using bash, add it to the .bash RC file, or if you are using zshell, add it to the .zshrc file. Then you can run this command to verify everything was installed correctly and print out the poetry version. You can then run this command to enable auto completion of poetry commands within your shell. And then we will use this command to integrate poetry into our project. This is a utility script. You'll see what I mean. I will accept the suggested response for each prompt. Except for this one, I will answer no. And this one, I will answer no. And I will answer yes to the generated pyproject.toml file. This in poetry land is like the package.json file in the Node.js world. We will now be using poetry to manage our dependencies, to run scripts against our project, to easily publish our code to the Python community, etc. And we no longer need this requirements.txt file, so it can be removed. Now that we have removed the requirements.txt file, let's reinstall our packages, but this time using poetry. The first thing we'll need to do is set up our virtual environment. The concepts of activation and deactivation still apply when using poetry. Here is the command for creating our virtual environment. You can see that a .vm file has been created, as well as you can see our prompt has changed. This is just like the experience we had when using product setup number one. The only difference is that the VM file that we created is now named the .vm file. So we can now install the third-party packages and they will be installed into the .vm folder. When they are done installing, we should be able to run a smoke test and verify that everything still works. Ta-da! Fantastic. Let's now play around with the pyproject.toml file to get a feel for what it does. We can open it up and start making some tweaks. Let's change the name of our project to be second setup, save that. Now let's change the name of the only package we have configured at the moment to be source. And let's add a script called main. And we see that this script is going to run a main file or main module inside of the source package. So we will need to create a folder called source that represents the source package and move our main.py file into the source package. Now let's test this all out. In order for the changes in our pyproject.toml file to work, 
we will need to deactivate the current virtual environment, delete the .vm folder, and then we should be able to reactivate the virtual environment and our changes should take effect. That looks good. You can see that the prompt has now been updated. And let's reinstall our packages. And we should be able to run our main script now. And hopefully everything works. Okay, so this is good. I'm happy this happened. So we need to export all of the files inside of our source package. And the way that we do that is via a underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore, dot py file. This is kind of like using an index.ts or index.js file when you're exporting modules from different parts of your node projects. And after we add this to the source package, which exports the main file or main module from it, we should then be able to run our main script. Voila, it works as expected. Now let's take a look at wrapping this up. We are going to add testing support. Then we are going to add auto formatting support. Then we're going to add auto reloading support and then take a quick look at the debugger and then finish. Here is how we set up automated testing. Let's close these files and install some dev dependencies. Dev dependencies are dependencies that you only need during development, not when the app is running in production. So let's install PyTest and let's install PyTest-Cov. For the Node.js and Rails developers, PyTest is to Python what Jest is to Node.js or what our spec is to Rails and pytest-cov is to Python what Istanbul is to Node.js or what simplecov is to Rails or Ruby. Now we can create a test directory to house all of our tests. PyTest will look for folders that begin with the name test and will look for files inside of said folders that begin with names test as well. And will scan the contents of those files for assertions that it will then report the success or failure of. So let's create a test file inside of the tests directory and populate it with this content. Save. And now we can run PyTest to get test reports. And here is how we get test coverage reports. For auto formatting, we will be using a package called black. It is extremely easy to use and set up. So we will install the black package as a dev dependency. And then we will integrate it with VS code by adding a dot VS code folder. And inside of this dot VS code folder, we will need to add a settings.json file 
And then we will populate this settings.json file with this content right here. Copy, paste, save. Now let's take a look at what happens when we open up some of our source code and save it. You can see that black is auto formatting our code according to its formatting rules. So if we add some spaces here, you can see that it fixes it. For auto reloading, we're gonna do something that might be a little bit unconventional. We are going to use a Node.js tool. We're gonna to use Nodemon. Here is how we incorporate Nodemon. We have to create a package.json file for installing it into our project. Then we will install Nodemon as a dev dependency. Then we will add the node modules folder to our git ignore. Then we will add these scripts here to the package.json file. Save, and now let's test this out. NPM run test. You can see that our test report has ran, and now let's see what happens when we edit one of our tests. It should automatically rerun our test report. So let's make this fail. Right. Let's make it pass again. Finally, let's take a quick look at debugging and then you will have a great overview of all of the features included in the second project setup. The way that you can do debugging with VS Code and Python is quite simple and easy. What you'll do is click on one of your files and you can place breakpoints to pause your code at different points by clicking on the line you want to pause at in the column to the left of the line number. So let's pause here, for example, and then VS Code is well integrated with the Python debugger and has a button or menu that will pop up here with two options for either running this file or debugging this file. We want to debug and it should pause here, right? We have paused at that point in the program. That's what that yellow line means. And that takes care of project setup number two.